So I'd like to explain why I personally think that the world needs a restart based on responsible innovation and design for values. And of course, here Delft is particularly strong and also some of the neighboring universities are very much engaged in this area. I'd like to ask, why are we doing this at all? I mean, let's go back in history. There was World War I, there was the fascist regime, this dictatorship, which was terrible, and also World War II and the Holocaust, and that had a deep impact on European history and the history of the world altogether. And as a result of those historical events, democracy and human rights were supposed to protect us from the repetition of such evil, right? For example, in Germany, in the Constitution, Article 1 is one or two articles, of course, of many constitutional articles that cannot be changed ever. And this is about human dignity. We'll have to think about this more, but the main point about human dignity is that humans are not supposed to be treated like animals or objects or data, even if we could do that. And this is really important because that means the algorithms that we're using to organize the world need to be organized in a different way and used in a different way. In the past decade, we've seen a number of key decisions that has basically determined the course the world has taken. And my personal impression is that in many cases, we have actually taken the wrong turn. So, of course, politicians want to do something for human dignity, but in many cases, they focus mainly on a job generation or job protection. And of course, in those times of automation fueled by digital revolution and other developments, this would put politics under continuous pressure, right? So basically we'll have AI algorithms and also robots that do a lot of work that humans have done in the past and that's probably a good thing, right? Just the question is how do we have to reshape the social and economic conditions, the framework of our society? <coughs> It's not the first revolution that happens driven by technology. There was the Industrial Revolution and other important reorganizations of the world. Now, if you look up history books, then basically it turns out that those times always came with financial and economic crisis and also revolutions and wars. We've had a financial crisis. We're not over it yet. Um, Many countries are suffering of economic crisis. We don't want revolution or war. So this time we have to be smarter. And it's not simple to be smarter than all the time in our human history. So we have really to learn something fundamentally different. Because in the past, actually, when there were these times of mass unemployment, it often ended up in wars and revolutions. This is, in a sense, the way history fixed the problem. I don't think this is a proper fix of the problem. And so we need to be much more proactive in order to reshape the societal framework. Worst comes to worst. There's a massive sustainability problem. We know about that since many decades, about 50 years ago. The Limit to Growth study was published. It was so impactful. Many people were shocked about the prospects of our world in the 21st century. And so the president at that time had an own committee look into these problems and the Global 2000 study was published at about 2000 pages. I mean, just the summary was about 150 pages, right? 
to give you an idea, not the one page abstract that we have. Everything we both studies came to the conclusion that as resources on this planet are limited, we would see economic and also population collapse in the 21st century. You know, so you might see some of this happen. And as a result, basically the United Nations came up with this agenda 2030 and the, with the sustainable development goals. We have now 11 years left to accomplish these goals. It's pretty clear that this is not doable with the world population that we have today. Either we will be late or something terrible will happen or the basis of this agenda is totally flawed, but you know, there is a problem somewhere and we cannot just ignore it. In response to the projected problems, an environmental movement started to form back in the 70s. People started to use UTA instead of plastic. We had these auto-free Sundays and all these kind of things actually started to happen but for mysterious reason, it stopped again. In fact, had we decided at that time to reduce resource consumption by just 3% every single year, we would now be sustainable. The planet wouldn't have any sustainability issues. We could have solved it. But at that time, some other decisions were taken. Basically, companies didn't want to sell less products and you know, use less resources, they said, we'll fix it, just let us do it. And so rather than replacing the capitalism 1.0 of that time by something better, like capitalism 2.0 or whatever, you know, um, one decided to replace democracy by something else. And you can read that, for example, in this book over here, the first global revolution by the Club of Rome, so there's a link to the Limits to Growth study. And so here, for example, there's a chapter on the limits of democracy. Democracy is not a panacea, and so on. So basically here, they argue that we need to have something better. And from these times on, certain circles were calling democracy into question. And then on another page, they say the common enemy of humanity is man, and the real enemy then is humanity itself. So we are basically in a situation where nature and humanity have become, as some people suggest, opposing forces. And humanity has become a danger, a threat to this planet altogether. And so this is being used now to argue we need to guide people's behavior and control what they're doing. So the overpopulation that people often talk about, I personally think has been caused by irresponsible business practices of some industry like the oil industry, and I will argue why. Because this business has been spread around the entire planet, and in this way it has created growth, but also a growth of the world population. <coughs> it has fueled through uh, fertilization of this planet, the growth of population, and we know exactly what happens if we do such a thing. For example, if there is a lake and you put some fertilizer into this lake, too much actually, we're talking about nitrate and things and phosphate and things that in agriculture sometimes are put out in bigger quantities that then should happen. And then what happens is basically those lakes will cause a large growth of fish and <coughs> plants and so on. And after some time, basically the ecosystem is collapsing, fish are dying in large numbers, and then there are laws that basically charge the person responsible for doing such a thing because that person has created an environmental disaster. 
in that lake. We have done basically the very same thing for the entire planet. Right? And so basically if you over fertilize them, what you expect that at a certain point in time there would be population collapse as you basically reach the carrying capacity of that ecosystem, in this case the planet. And in fact, these are the projected numbers and certainly not exact. So you can argue about it and some people say this is wrong and that is wrong, but at least you know you can see that death rate would skyrocket sometime in this century if we just let things go as they've been in the past. So basically the system that we had in the past that was serving us well for a long time is not future proof. It's not sustainable. It will not work forever. This is what we know. So we need a systemic change. And in fact, systemic change has been started after September 11, in fact, a new kind of society has been rolled out, a data-driven and ai control society, and justified with war on terror and other arguments, right? And so basically a lot of data has been collected about us, but also about everything, like the resources of this planet. The idea is, of course, that resources get short, we need to know where all the resources are and who is consuming them and all these kind of things, right? And so basically a lot of personal data has been collected and some companies know pretty well what you think and what your personality is and how you can be manipulated to think or feel certain things or decide or do certain things. And in fact, Tristan Harris has been working in a Google control room, as they call it, explains in his interesting TED talk how a handful of tech companies controls billions of minds every day. So that's kind of the outcome. And that was kind of justified by saying, oh, we need to change the environmental behavior, the health behavior of the people and so on. So, you know, will make that in a painless way by changing their way of thinking. But in fact, of course, that is mind control. And in fact, it was even going so far that people started to consume less. And of course, for today's economic system, there's nothing worse that can happen because this system needs grows in order to compensate for the debt spiral and to produce new jobs given automation. So mm -hmm. basically when people consume that, that's which would have been the right thing to do, companies started basically to force people to consume more by ever more sophisticated marketing strategies, including neuromarketing, I mean, highly personalized messages that would really get you. And also, politics have used it for election manipulation. Whoever did it, you know, uh, I don't want to say this country or that country or this company or that company. I guess there have been a lot of players manipulating elections with these kind of tools, right? So neuromarketing is the thing and basically the idea of those people who like it is that they would like to have something like a buy button and so whenever they think you have money to spend and they want to sell you something they'd like to have a digital button to press it and make you spend your money right and a lot of things have happened. So digital companies have been thinking about reshaping the world. Now we have a new currency, big data. We have a new legal system, code is law. We have a new economy, the attention economy. We have this nudging society, I mean, a new kind of politics. And you know, some of that was intentional, right? It was clear to those people that they were breaking the rules or even the laws. They wanted to do that because they saw this old system 
and maybe democracy included. In fact, some people have said it's an outdated technology. They, they wanted to break it because they thought it would be old fashioned and there would be something better and people like Peter Thiel even wants to get rid of politics altogether, right? He says, we're in a deadly race between politics and technology. The fate of our world may depend on the effort of a single person, probably himself. Uh, uh, who makes the world safe for capitalism? It doesn't say safe for humans or safe for human dignity or safe for democracy. He says safe for capitalism, right? Surveillance capitalism. And in fact, this, this is from a video that you can find on YouTube. Are you ready to cross threshold or boundaries? You know, this is about um, campaigning, political campaigning. So it, it tells you everything about the mindset of these people and in fact has been used to rig the Brexit vote and certain kinds of election and Cambridge Analytica has shown you what happens when military propaganda is being privatized and a lot of the fake news epidemics that we have today is driven by technology and, and social barter amplified and algorithmic filtering and so on and so on and basically the justification for all that technology is that in times of short resources we need to watch resources and we need to watch the people who are using them. And so basically a digital panopticon was created, right? Panopticon is basically the model for the perfect prison, you know? And um, there was a project at the MIT where they even had that in the background of their web page. It just flashed up very shortly, then after three seconds it disappeared again. <laughs> <laughs> I have that. Um, but anyway, you know, these kind of, we have these circular structures everywhere. Like this is a GCHQ, for example, a British Secret Service. Uh, looks a little bit like a <laughs> panopticum. Is it by chance? I don't know. But so the idea is to come up with something like uh, Karma Police a program that would create a citizen score based on what everyone is doing or not doing, including the videos that you're watching, the radio sh music that you're listening to and all these kinds of things would get plus or minus points. And so the idea is, yeah, when resources get short, we need to distribute them in a just and fair way and we need to figure out who deserves scarce resources and who doesn't deserve them. It's a digital judgment system. It's not just pre-crime or predictive policing. It goes much further than that. This is an all-encompassing system, basically, to manage society in the future. Now, the question is, how just would it be? And let's take a very simple example of um, Google counting citations. I guess every one of you is using a Google Scholar, right? And so this is a snapshot that I happened to make in, on March 1, 2019. Uh, just have a look at Reto over here. He was cited by 54,299 papers, 54,000, remember. <laughs> Uh, remember this. Now, April 7, after this, just a few days after this, there should have been more citations, right? Instead, it's uh, 53,159, so it's 1,000 citations less. Why is this happening? Because it's not a ba database approach. It's a big data approach. Similar example over here, just by coincidence, I made this snapshot on March 18, 2019 about somebody, and you can see 
3,275 citations. April 6th, a couple of days later, 3,275 citations filed. And similar things like 2,308 versus 2,305. So, in fact, yeah, citations lost. So if they cannot even count citations, how would you want to be able to come up with a fair and just picture of your entire life? In fact, there has been a lot of discussion about discrimination of women, of people of color, and so on, by algorithms. And that's an issue, in particular, if you're talking about serious shortages of materials, of health services, or maybe even about life and death situations. So this kind of technology has been, as far as I can judge it, developed in Western countries, but then it was spread to autocratic countries. And so their technological te totalitarianism, as we would call it over here, was tested. I mean, I admit that in China, many people say it's a good system. Here, we, we wouldn't see it as a system that we'd like to have it in Europe or in the United States. But you know, there, there is a possibility that this would be re-imported. And from my point of view, this is a totalitarian system. Maybe some disagreement, and that's fine. That's why we, why we have scientific discussions and controversies and debates. But I mean, there are containment camps for apparently a million people. And so this is not just about collecting credit while you consume or you go by bike rather than by car or something. This is something more serious than that. And then several political leaders have started to question human rights also in democratic countries. So one day you could read this. Erdogan was mentioning Hitler Germany as an example. When Japan's vice minister found Hitler's intentions all right. And Syriza May said, oh, maybe in the fight against terror, we would need to abolish human rights to some extent. And also in Switzerland, we had similar debates. Now, this is not something that I'm making up. This is, this is in the air. This is a problem. So. For this very reason, we wrote that article, Will Democracy Survive Big Data and Artificial Intelligence? And I agree with Martin Schulz at that time. Unfortunately, he didn't repeat it many times. Now, we need to fight against this technological totalitarianism. I don't think this is going to solve the world's problems. We need to have more innovation to come up with new solutions those problems. For example, a circular economy would change everything, right? At the moment, we're running into these resource shortages because we're using fresh resources, we produce stuff that's being consumed and then thrown away in many cases. That's irresponsible. We need to change our economic system, a logistic system. So, I would say something like a power grab has happened by digital means. You know, before in Europe and elsewhere, we had democracy as the framework and capitalism as an operation system for our economy. And then in the meantime, sometimes it appears to be just the other way around that capitalism is the framework and democracy is kind of the garnish um, and so surveillance capitalism has replaced democracy and now we have a market conform democracy as they optimistically are saying. And so basically I think there is a risk that we might 
the ending in a situation that would be terrible where the so-called overpopulation problem would play out. That's a book that was recommended to me by somebody who is preparing scenarios for the future for the government. So uh, it's, it's not something that I picked. This is a book that opened my eyes because I was sleeping at that time. So and that's why we have all those debates about trolley problems and so on. We basically come up with autonomous systems that would take life and death decisions. We may not kill each other anymore on the battlefield as it has happened in the past. We'll have AI systems that, that will kill people if we allow this to happen in a totally just way by AI systems that cannot count citations. And in fact, the Pentagon is preparing for mass civil breakdown. You could read in a major newspaper. The elites know exactly that the system that they're running is not future proof because that's why they have all these bunkers. You know, how responsible is this to run a system that you know that it wouldn't work? And so no wonder we now have these demonstrations by schools, Fridays for Future, this is Greta Thunberg, and she says the older generation has failed. And so that brings us to you. You're the younger generation, right? So basically now it's your turn to fix it. No question. <laughs> no. No <judgment. laughs> I do think that rather than this old competitive mode that we've had, which was kind of built on the paradigm, everyone against everyone else, it was kind of the basis of competition in our economic system, but also there is competition between classmates and neighbors. We've been raised in this paradigm. I think if you want to get through these times successfully, then we should try another approach this time based on cooperation and solidarity, helping each other and building a circular economy. You know, I think it's not too late. We can do that. You know, it's not about USA against Russia and China. No, this time it should be about USA and Europe and Russia and China, Asia, Africa, you know, all together. Let us sort it out because everyone has skills and knowledge and talents and resources. And so don't repeat the mistakes of the past because we've always done these wars and revolutions and terrible things in those times. Now this time, let's be smarter. Let's do something else. And I very much like this PhD school because there are quite a lot of innovative ideas that are coming up. And we had a seminar already a couple of months ago. That's the second one. There will be a third one. And it's about the question, can we engineer a more responsible digital future. And in fact, people are now talking about digital ethics. It has become even a business field, I would say. Companies realize that they need to do something and they would be able to make money with ethical technologies. We need to learn to design for values depending on what you want to do with the systems. I mean, on the application domain, privacy, self-determination, fairness, and so on dignity, happiness, well-being. And we need to resist the temptation of inappropriate generalizations. And so basically, yes, in principle, of course, you could use an algorithm that has been created for a huge logistic system <coughs> or for an entertainment park or whatever, you could roll it out on cities and over this planet and organize people like objects, but this is not appropriate, right? 
And that's the temptation. You have this algorithm that works for logistics, and then couldn't we apply it basically to organize chicken and pig farming more efficiently? And maybe, yes, you can. And then the next thing w you would do is, oh, that's expand our business even further can we use it basically you hunt down terrorists or find criminals and uh, turn them down and then maybe we can expand predictive analytics to unemployment and then some doesn't have to be the chinese people some test crowd of people and then in the end everyone you know it's i find this problematic because as I told you, human dignity is exactly about treating humans different from animals and treating animals different from objects. Just, you know, as an example, you know, perhaps Tinder, everyone has heard about it, nobody has ever used it, I know. Uh, so, but the point is, you would swipe away people into a digital waste basket basically right so you would treat people like objects and now it's haunting people so basically uh, what this article is saying oh actually there's the less and less people who have sex and partly because they have so frustrating experiences that now they're being shocked you know they're being treated like objects in a shopping mall and that's a very frustrating experience, right? And so basically, this is a boomerang effect. We have proposed to turn war rooms into peace rooms, where basically there would be additional transparency, a democratic framework of use, interdisciplinary teams of scientists to guarantee high uh, scientific standards ethical advisors, a multi-perspective approach, and participatory opportunities for NGOs and civil society and so on. We propose to create platforms for informational self-determination to give us back control over our digital doubles and decide what company and what NGO or institution would be allowed to use what piece of our data for what purpose. And maybe period of time and price. So all personalized products and services would be possible, just you decide about the level of personalization and what company would get access to data. So com companies would be in a competition for trust to get access to data because otherwise they cannot offer you personalized products. And that competition for trust would create a trusted digital society, exactly what we want. We also want to avoid that algorithm just take over and control the world entirely. Of course, we could create algorithms this way that they decide everything. Take something that needs to be decided by yes or no, and there say six criteria that are being measured, you could say if kind of less than three speak in favor of this, then basically we decide no, if more than three criteria speak in favor of this, then we have a yes decision. But then there is nothing for humans to decide. We could instead, however, also design algorithms this way that we say okay if there's a clear no like just one or two criteria in favor let's have the machine decide if there's a clear yes like five or six criteria let's have the machine decide why should we bother about those things that are clear anyway but there are these boundary cases where it depends on how important is this criterion versus that criterion where it makes sense to weight it. And you may want to have a say. And so we need to learn to design for meaningful freedom in times of algorithmic control. We can also learn to upgrade democracy digitally 
and for this you know it's good to know what democracy is about it doesn't didn't happen by accident i would say it's the outcome of a long historical process of wars and revolutions and learning processes and so we shouldn't just throw it away we should at least think about all those things and how important they are for a system to work well and create a framework for a thriving society and in principle we could learn to build this into our platforms at least some platforms where it's appropriate so again this is about designing for values Actually, in Zurich, we have started to work on such platforms such as Empower Polis. We've even won the ETH Policy Challenge. And people have started to think about smart cities in new ways. Well, in the beginning, it was all about automation of cities, as if it would just be a giant supply chain, technology-driven. Now people say, OK, should be technology enabled and city led and then there should be co-creation by citizens and you know there should also be designed for values so now it's time to upgrade those old concepts of smart cities and bring citizens back and civil society and in our talents and skills and interests right and among the measures that we have proposed to unleash mass innovation and creativity was City Olympics, where basically cities and regions around the world would enter a friendly competition every two years to come up with new innovative solutions to the problems that plague the world. There would be different disciplines, like uh, reducing climate change, improving energy efficiency, uh, improving resilience or sustainability or peace or solidarity. And cities and regions would pay for that kind of mega hackathon which is thanks over several months and all the stakeholders could contribute to it. Cities would be in this competition to come up with smarter solutions and also invest into new technologies and uh, increase awareness of the problems and what we can do and all these kind of things. And and then the solutions would be open source and creative commons so every city could take it develop it further companies could combine different solutions and lift it to an entirely new level so this is not just about competition this also has this cooperation phase where all those different approaches and ideas can be tied together and combinatorial innovation will be unleashed in all the countries together so wouldn't that be exciting this is a positive approach towards a challenging future and this is what we should do so a new approach that i'd like to call localization think global act local and diverse that means we need to make more experiments some will fail we need to learn from each other we should help each other this is how to work our way forward in these challenging times, I think. And so I'm very glad that we have this PhD school over here, Engineering Social Technology in for a Responsible Digital Future. And we have eight PhD students, and we have structured it basically in three branches, trust and reputation, resilience and participation, each of these branches will be giving some insights into some of our activities today and we have invited complementary external speakers too to have an outside view and of course we'd also like to encourage debates